thank you for that wonderful introduction and thank you to all of you for joining. I actually think this is probably um, the most complex and difficult conversation uh, to have because it's, it's very big and it really asks us to consider some of the most difficult questions out there. The, the title of the panel, um, Urgent Measures, Reforming Global Institutions and Frameworks, uh, clearly for our meeting, the G20 is at the heart of this. Um, and I thought that what Dr. Jay Shanker said to us last night um, really set the stage well for this discussion. When he said um, the, the formal multilateral institutions are stuck and so the G20 becomes phenomenally important because of its flexibility across a number of dimensions as well as its ability to reach out to stakeholders in the state system internationally, but also civil society. And India has done a tremendous job for us and set the bar extremely high. And I would like to start by saying thank you so much um, to those who have led this initiative. We know who you are, and we hope that you now know who we are. Um, to start out, let me just say a couple of things. Um, the, we know the term polycrisis. We haven't perhaps used it as much in this moment, but we know that we're sitting at a time in world history where the complexity and the urgency of cooperating multilaterally to solve the urgent problems of climate change, uh, uh, the spillover and unintended consequences of the war in Ukraine, um, the debt problem, uh, the post-COVID recovery, the list is so long and it clearly creates a very important need to move swiftly in the context of a, of a system that seems very fraught and very stuck, and the other side of the equation, which we also know well, is the geopolitical rivalry makes this much more difficult, not least as it's playing out across developing countries, as well as in Europe and elsewhere. Um, but also the challenges internally inside of some of the most um, consequential states in the system. And we uh, went to sleep or woke to the news of the indictment of Donald Trump, the, the, the next set of indictments, and we're now facing a multilateral system that could, um, in the not too distant future, have two permanent members of the Security Council with leaders that are indicted, either domestically or globally. So there are so many reasons in which the legitimacy of the system is fraught, stuck, and yet the urgency is critical. So I wanna start by asking the panel a very important but question that, that involves what I hope will be a quick answer and then we'll come back to the first question as it was set um, by the organizers. But I guess the first question is, in this context, which is fraught but also urgent, should the focus be on um, incrementalism and pragmatism and finding ways to work within but especially uh, perhaps to work around the system such as we know it? incrementalism and pragmatism, or should we be working for something more transformative, arguably radical, that can really deal with a multipolar world in which there are many stakeholders that need to be involved, that needs to be more inclusive if it's going to be both legitimate with the assumption that legitimacy is, is critical to efficacy. So let me start with you. Um, incrementalism or radical transformation, Maria? Um. Well, let me first thank uh, the, the, the organizers, congratulate all of you, and uh, thank the team, the TF7 team, for uh, well, putting together, as, as you were saying, uh, a difficult set of recommendations simply because the scope of the, of the task force work itself is so, and was so large. But in terms of your question, which is also uh, a very challenging one, we have to think of the scope and we have to think of the focus. And I think the scope, as you were pointing to, is, is very, very broad. But we have to be bold, we have to be innovative, and at the same time be realistic. And in that sense, I think that it is important to think of being, yes, transformative, but not starting from scratch. We do need multilateralism. We do need global cooperation. Otherwise, it's not going to be possible to tackle the the, the very complex challenges. And so it's a matter of, uh, in, in, in my perspective at least, it's a matter of transforming 
uh, and with imagination, with creativity, and bringing in those elements that allow us to be as, uh, as innovative as possible, but seeking that dialogue and that exchange that is essential if we're going to find common ground and it's essential if we're going to move forward. So it's a bit of both, transformative, but also both. incremental and pragmatic. Okay. Um, Andre. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you to ORF for putting this together. Um, to give you a direct answer, I would say the way to go would be for a more radical transformation. And for the following reason, it's easier to create new institutions than to reform the existing ones. And I think we have witnessed this during the last decades. The BRICS groupings it, itself has been struggling for a while now to reform international financial institutions. But the result it has reaped, primarily in terms of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, has been too little and too late, just to give you one example. And so new institutions have been set up, uh, many of them by China, but we have also the new development bank by the BRICS, the contingent reserve arrangement, and, and others. And that has been uh, the possibility to advance, if you will, that has presented itself currently, right? And institutions are very hard to reform, at least in any, to any significant extent, primarily because those who hold institutional power they don't give it up easily, and they don't share it easily either. Uh, and so there's a lot of resistance. But not only that, institutions, they gain a life of their own, and they reinvent themselves, and they don't like also to be replaced. Uh, uh, and you know, perhaps the most extreme example of that, and one that's uh, very relevant to the geopolitical context nowadays is, is NATO, right? Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. And Great. I'll... We'll come back. You, lots in there, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. Uh, Rina. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for this important question. Um, I would say that we need to interplay with both realities, and it's not black or white. I think it's like a kind of a gray. So um, I think that we need to address uh, the, the momentum that we are uh, seeing in world politics because the multilateral system and the multilateral order is facing its greatest threat since Second World War, and the United Nations is at the center of the stage. So the war in Ukraine, the post-COVID world order, and also the new rivalry between China and United States drive us to geopolitical tensions, stalemate, and gridlock. So we are witnessing competing ambitions in world politics, and I think this is really important to uh, point out because we are seeing the clash between the system establishment and the anti-system forces. We are uh, witnessing the clash between open and closed societies, the tensions between globalist and nationalist and nativist, and also the antagonist forces between liberal democracy and electoral autocracies. So uh, I think that all these tensions have weakened the, the spirit of international cooperation and, and it's uh, deepening polarization within uh, the, the G20 membership. So it's a moment of unprecedented uh, transnational challenges. We need to reform to ensure uh, peace, economic growth, and uh, prosperity. So I strongly think that the G20 needs to champion the cause of multilateralism by exhibiting the gains and the benefits to serve collective interests in the global agenda. So uh, I, also, I, I also think that G20 uh, needs to exhibit the cost, needs to show, to, to make it visible, the cost of abandoning international cooperation and disengagement of global institutions. The only way to uh, move forward is to persuade the major powers to cooperate by displaying the cost of action versus the cost of inaction. So one of the main questions uh, in this uh, debate should be if we are willing to accept the, the, the cost of shifting from multilateralism to uh, plurilateral agreements and minilateralism. 
So uh, regionalism blocks the universal uh, approach, need to solve the supranational uh, problems today. And minilateralism is bringing fragmentation because it's about initiatives with fewer states, non-binding commitments, and also uh, with uh, specific threats. So I, I, I will say that um, that uh, we need uh, the, a coordinated response to tackle uh, climate change, uh, no nuclear proliferation, uh, migration, pandemics, and none of the states can act uh, uh, in, a, in a lowly. Uh, we, we need. Uh, we, we cannot all. Uh, um, we cannot act uh, with a small group of na of, of, of nations. Because I think that minilateralism is not the correct approach, uh, because it's uh, deepened the competing visions and undermines the convergence of common interests. So, uh, just to say a final word, that I, I consider that we need to emphasize the value added of cooperation, dialogue against the cost of isolation, self governance, and nationalism. Thank you. Um, Antonio. Well, Leslie, let me put it this way. This is not the G20. We are in the context of the Think 20. So we are scholars. And as scholars, uh, we can afford to be ambitious. But we have to be pragmatic at the same time. So being a scholar, it's a, it is also our responsibility to say, what is the first best? I mean, we know that global governance is not working. We know that it is unfair. We know that it is not very effective. So we have to pave the way and indicate what is the path okay, towards you know, the world political leaders should you know, go through. The point is that we have to consider the time frame. In the mid, well, short to mid term, I don't think that there is any room for major you know, transformation of the global governance. And do, I don't see the conditions in the international context to do it now. So we have to make a difference between what we can achieve in the short term, which is, you know, technical deliverables, mostly, and implementation of what has been decided so far in multilateral context, and what we can achieve, what we should achieve in the mid to long term, which is a more transformative vision of global governance. Thank you. Um, tremendous kind of opening responses to that first question that I think in some ways reflect uh, the conversations in our um, task force seven and where there was, I, I think it's fair to say, um, I don't think it was off the record, and I think it's certainly in the statement that the, um, that the leading, the leaders had a very strong view that, that, the, that, that one needed to focus on um, the multilaterals and not just quickly move to plurilateralism, in part because th those organizations matter and they're not yet um, representative and so wouldn't be quite, you know, your sort of comment, I think, about sort of their stuck and work elsewhere didn't seem to be s satisfactory, actually, for a number of people um, on the task force. So that's, that's one question. But let me come to this first, this first question that, that was sort of set for us, which is, um, about consensus building and how, how can the G20 help to build a consensus uh, for multilateral reform? Um, again, in this context of so much division, and I, and I guess I would add to that question, there seems to be um, a semblance of a lot of consensus in this meeting, but the G20, I know we're scholars, and I know it's the T20, not everybody here is a scholar, um, but um, there's, not, there's not a lot of representation from the United States, China, or Russia, which are critical members of the G20. So there might feel like there's a lot of consensus and ambition and drive in the room, but the G20 extends to some pretty complicated parts of the world so bearing that in mind, uh, can we start with you on this very complicated question? How, how concretely, or in your, in your view, does, does one think about beginning to build consensus? Well, if we think of, of, uh, of the G20 to a certain extent as a sample of uh, not only of the economies of the world, but of the countries of the world that we have uh, in the G20 developed uh, countries emerging, economies, developing economies, and, and in, in, if we think of it as a sample, it, it would seem to be uh, 
an appropriate place to try to start achieving that consensus. But as you were saying, there are uh, a number of uh, countries also within the G20 that are uh, the, 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 the very source of, all, of or the, the very heart and core of the competition that, and the tensions that we're experiencing today. So in, in that sense, uh, the G20 can very certainly lead the way in terms of of that consensus building and and show the way not only lead the way but show the way and but that being said it the, i think we are also at a time when we know that within the the very heart of the multilateral system which is the un system or the 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 the, the major actor let's say in the multilateral system the uh, the un system there is a lot of conversation a lot of effort in terms of consensus building for reform of the system for, to find ways of of uh, of advancing uh, that reform, and the tensions are obviously translated into that space as well. But uh, we are going to be seeing in the coming weeks, in fact, a number of discussions. Not only uh, with the G20, which will be the first one, the G20 summit uh, in early September, but later in uh, in the month we'll see a number of high-level discussions and summits that will be addressing and we'll, where we will be discussing or our governments will be discussing those major challenges that, that we're referring to. And uh, from climate to the SDGs to the financing for development to health, uh, a number of, of, uh, of these challenges. And that is, that'll be an opportunity uh, to really move in terms of the consensus. Whether that's possible or not will certainly take a lot of political will and certainly a lot of leadership. But I think that um, it gets to a point, or it has gotten to a point, where the realization of the need of that consensus is is uh, sorely felt. And so, in in terms of the, the the way forward, the way forward has to come from certainly from within, and it has to come through that political will and the leadership. Let me, let me follow up and just ask you one quick question, um, which I had sort of wanted to ask everybody, but maybe it'll come in at different moments. And that is, um, do you think there's an advantage or a disadvantage in the fact that the G20 is focused on uh, a broader agenda, on a development agenda, and not really on the high politics of peace and security? Or is it the case that the current uh, geopolitical context, you know, it, it all sort of filters down and um, the divisions over, not least, the war in Ukraine, the conflict, um, uh, kind of get in the way at every single level. Can, can you work below the radar and be productive in forming a consensus, or are those broader divisions um, ultimately uh, creating some real barriers to consensus building? Hmm. I think that the, the broader divisions certainly create those barriers, but by the same token, um, the world can, does not function, cannot function in silos. So you do need to have, uh, to take into account the different elements because they do play on each other, they do affect each other. So in that sense, um, I, I, I think that the G20's broadened agenda uh, makes eminent sense in, in that scaling up uh, process that I was referring to earlier. Thank you. Um, Andre, how, do you, how, does, how can the G20 best help to build a consensus for multilateral reform? Thank you. Uh, let me just clarify and qualify what I, I said earlier. By radical transformation, I meant it, the way forward may be to create new institutions rather than trying to reform. The other ones, which was what I equated with the incrementalist approach. Now, uh, that is not to say that's a perfect approach. It's full of problems, not least of which you end up with a system that's more fragmented and thereby less efficient. And I do recognize that all these plurilateral, minilateral uh, arrangements, if you will, they're not just a stepping stone in the direction of a wider multilateral uh, framework. Right. Oftentimes, they're just what's possible at the time. Like-minded countries come together and, you know, they form their own clubs and they keep the others out. But anyway, having said that, what is the role of the G20? Well, we recognize the G20 is probably the most important forum for addressing problems of multilateralism because it's 
almost the only one that brings together all the major players, the major stakeholders, right? And, and the ones from the G7, the, the, the big economies and high-income countries, and the, the, the major economies from the South. So, so, the, so it is the, the forum for that purpose, but we also need to recognize, and this was also discussed in our meetings, that the G20 itself reflects some of the problems that we have with multilateral institutions. I mean, the, the deadlocks that we reach in other forums, in other venues, are also present here in the ambit of, of the G20. So, and, and by the way, and this speaks to, to the second question you posed, uh, I don't think geopolitics can be filtered in any way. It's there. It takes precedence over other issues, including development, gender, climate, what have you, and it tends to subsume them all. And it's very much an elephant in the room. I don't, I don't think we can simply look away and try to fly under the radar, as you put it. Um, because th this is, again, um, it's something that tends to, to trump everything else, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and how, how do, well, wh what do we do in that context, right? How do we build consensus? I think we need a, a broad recognition that the system that's there is no longer fit for purpose. It was created during a post-war period where you know, the, the world was a very different place. Um, at that time, the main challenge was to develop the so-called third world, and a, a lot of countries were gaining political independence. Nowadays, the main challenge is uh, to provide the so-called global public goods. You know? And for, for that purpose, you need a lot more of coordination, if not collaboration, than you did before. At the time that the institutions that are now in force were created, we had a more stable system because we had a hegemony of the United States, at least in the West, uh, which for better or for worse, provided stability and, um, and shaped the system in, in a way and made it work. And nowadays, with the considerable transitions of power that we're witnessing, we have nothing of the sort. And finally, at that time, we had a clear north-south divide, which, again, is no longer seen nowadays and actually is reflecting, and, and this is the, the point I'd like to make as to, to moving forward, it's reflecting in, in the global political agenda. Uh, the, the division of the north and south seems to be disappearing everywhere. And with it, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities that was coined in the Environmental Conference of 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, but has since then all but been forgotten. And I think that principle is, is very important because it recognizes countries have different capacities and they should contribute to providing global public goods to the extent that they're capable of doing so, right? And this is something that's lost when we treat them all as equal and we want to share uh, the burden of development finance without regard to those capabilities as well. I'll stop here. Andre, let me follow up on just one, one question, one concrete question for you, because you're sort of, your idea that sort of don't focus on the incrementalism of trying to reform the, the existing multilaterals, leave that aside and, and be more, I guess, radical and transformative by creating new agreements. But what about the concrete question of Security Council reform and, and the UN General Assembly? A, a lot of what we have in that um, task force, in that statement, is about, and this has obviously been very important to India, the US is supporting a version of this, the United Kingdom uh, Security Council reform. Would you say, you know, park it, it's not gonna happen, leave it there, we know it doesn't feel good, we know it's not right, and we know it doesn't reflect the existing distribution of power, we know it's not seen to be legitimate as by many people across the world. However, it's too hard, it's too tough, and let's, let's kind of, you know, set that aside and go, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, and, and I, actually, I, I think the UN Security Council is a very good example. I, I don't think it's going to be a reform, even though our, our governments want it to. And, and I think legitimately, we ask for greater representation. I, I, th I think th there's no argument as, you know, that, it should be reform, uh, but we don't see the prospect of any reform. But does that, but does, let, me, let me come back again. Does that mean leave it there and work on other issues, or does that mean leave it there and create another organization that can deal with conferring legitimacy on questions of peace and security? It's, it's a really important point, and then I'll come on uh, to, to you, Rena. But do you, have a, do you have a response to that? Is it just sort of leave that whole question 
um, that whole aspiration, right, that you can confer legitimacy on the use of force, that you can talk collectively about responding to a crisis and peace and security. Just leave it aside because we're not going to get reform. So leave the whole bucket of issues aside and, and work on climate and development. And, you know, that's where you can get some, some progress. I, I would argue that security issue area is different from the rest. Yeah, and it's very hard to leave it aside. But having said that, to the extent that it lacks legitimacy and that it's being challenged by other players who want greater representation and cannot get it, I think it will over time lose importance. And it, it will cease to be at the center stage at some point. Uh, uh, so yeah. I'm sure we'll come back to that. I mean, it's an interesting, it's, a, it's an important one to keep on the table, not least because there is more, um, more demand and more call and it feels like however intractable it might be that there are some very major powers um, that are getting behind uh, the question of um, Security Council reform. China, I don't think, is one of them. Um, but let's come to you on this question of how do you build consensus around multilateral reform? Leslie, I just wanted to mention that uh, geopolitics should be everybody's business that the global governance is uh, directly linked to uh, human well-being and that we need to display all the uh, interdependences and uh, the interplays that uh, this, uh, this concept has to be with uh, regarding quality of life. So I think that we cannot, there are no conditions for, um, um, for moving forward in, uh, in multilateralism, how to reform multilateral, multilateralism due to the geopolitical tensions. But I think that we can provide momentum. I think that we can um, provide, a, we, we can raise awareness about the importance of the reform. The, the need to reform is uh, urgent, but I think the probability to reach it is null due to uh, geopolitical tensions and gridlock. So therefore, the G20 needs to work on a minimum agreed agenda, on basics, on, the, on basic understanding, and also um, uh, we need to identify common ground uh, in order to uh, face the interlocking crisis and uh, face the transnational challenges. So I think that we are trapped because we are not uh, moving forward. Uh, the most convincing proposals to reform global institutions are ineffective because there's a lack of political will. So there is no um, political will to transform. So I think that we need to reform inwards. We need to review uh, best practices inside the international organizations. We need to, uh, to empower uh, techniques inside the international organizations. And also we need to deal with conflict because according to real politics, conflict is permanent and natural in international relations, but also we need to, uh, to interplay with the self-state interest with public goods. I think this is one of the most important challenges. So I think that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that, um, uh, we, we, we need to move forward uh, just um, trying to understand that we need to um, uh, provide a strategic communication for uh, the common people why global governance and why uh, multilateralism is, uh, is, is important for a human well-being. And we need to uh, show the gains and uh, benefits of a collective interest and collective response. Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot in there and we'll come back to it, but let me first come to you um, for your, your response to this question on how do you build a consensus in the G20? How can the G20 help push forward that consensus? Well, let's do it like this. Let's make the health check of consensus today or the lack of international con consensus because uh, as you mentioned, there is a big elephant in the room, which is the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war is a game changer in terms of international consensus, but the effect that the Ukraine war is having on international organization, international bodies is uneven, extremely uneven, because it is undermining some international bodies and revitalizing other international bodies. Let's make an example, NATO. 
In 2019, Macron, the president of France, defined, uh, said that NATO was uh, in brain, brain death. He was almost dead. He was dead. And just months before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, uh, NATO was in shutters. That is okay, a regional uh, organization. The G uh, but now, NATO has been totally revitalized. Nobody could think of an enlarged NATO with Sweden, with Finland, and in the future, undefined future, uh, Ukraine. I mean, nobody could even imagine that a dead organization would be so, whether you like it or not, but would be so active today. Take the G7. Even the G7 was dead. I mean, we didn't, even, we didn't even know what was the agenda of the G7 anymore, because all, everything, of course, was given to the G20. Again, and there was also a big fight, a transatlantic fight under Trump. We couldn't even have a joint declaration of the G7 under Trump. Now, G7 has a new mission. So, the Ukraine war, war revitalized this regional plurilateral organization, while we have to admit candidly and transparently that it's having a very negative effect on multilateral institutions, including the G20. I don't want to talk about the G20. By the way, in, given these circumstances, the Indian presidency, and not because we are in India, is doing something incredible because realize perfectly what are the constraints and really see that what we can do at the moment is to provide you know, guidelines, principles, try to implement as much as possible what has been decided so far. And this is what the Indian presidency correctly is uh, absolutely doing. So get me wrong, great. But we cannot really realistically expect so much from the summit, as we cannot really expect so much from the COVID-28. Let's take COVID-27. Okay, we are all happy that we have the loss and damage fund, which is an empty box. Nobody knows who is going to pay for it. Nobody knows where the money is going. Nobody knows for what this money will be spent. And I will not, I would be extremely surprised to see, you know, that all these issues will be uh, fixed and tackled by COP28. I would be extremely surprised to see it. So we have to acknowledge this, that unfortunately the Ukraine war is having an impact on international bodies, a very uneven impact. So it is galvanizing, it's revitalizing plurilateral institutions, including BRICS. Not everybody wants to join BRICS, okay? Including also the new ones, okay? While it is undermining, unfortunately, multilateral organization. So by recognizing this, and I stop here, what the G20 can do is to build consensus so on the things on which there is ability to deliver. Because ultimately, the success of an anybody depends on its ability to deliver. And this is precisely what the Indian presidency is trying to do. And for me, this is the best way to proceed. Thank you. I'm glad that you, that you underlined, underscored the, the impact of the war um, on the difficult impact of the war on the G20 and on multilateralism, but it's not only the war, it's also the United States and China, um, as we all know. Uh, and, it, and, and also the opportunity that's created um, for India, and I, and I share with you your view on, this, on the extraordinary opportunity. Um, and there's a question of, you know, in how many more ways can that be leveraged? But, it, you know, your comments get us to, to the next question that was set. And the questions are so good that I am following the rule book, um, which is, is, is this question about, you know, what can the, can the G20, you know, bring developing countries together? How do you keep developing countries together? But I, I kind of wanted to add on to it. It's, there is a huge focus and importantly and necessarily on collaboration and consensus building across developing countries, but the G20 is not just about developing countries. And so, you know, my question is, as we take on this, this, you know, this sort of third agenda item that's been set for the panel on how do you build consensus between developing countries, how do you do that, and also bring along the United States, China, Russia, and others, because if that doesn't happen, then the G20 isn't really the G20 anymore. It's something altogether different. And I think it's, um, it's the elephant in the room that, that has to be 
continued to be embraced. And, and so, the, you know, the, on this question of developing country cooperation, I would ask you to also consider to what extent um, are geopolitics creating a, a very significant barrier, even for the G20, as well as an opportunity in, in, in harnessing that, that collective potential um, develop, of developing countries? Complicated question, but it's sort of the well, fundamental but, uh, question, isn't it? Yes, let me just step back, if I may, uh, going back to the Security Council, if I just very briefly. Please, no, do. Please. Um, there's one thing that I think we, we cannot forget to at least try to do, and, and that's look seriously and carefully at the UN Charter and what the UN Charter does allow us to at least think of and, and explore uh, in terms of uh, reform within the system. And uh, in, in that sense, thinking of the possibility of uh, the review mechanism that the Charter does uh, have in it, in one of its articles, uh, that, that the possibility of, of a review of the Charter, it's very bold, but it is possible. It, uh, it going and then to what Antonio was referring to, um, as I was as well, in terms of the, the time frame and the timing, probably it's not the best time because of the geopolitical tensions, but we must remember that there are possibilities within the system also to, to review and to look at different ways of, of, uh, of doing things. Just add a, a note on that. And then on, on your question about whether the, the current tensions in the geopolitics, are, uh, of course they are affecting, of course they are uh, hampering uh, efforts. And the war uh, in, in Ukraine has brought a third party in contention, in, 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 in open contention, because until very recently we were thinking about U.S.-China relations. Now it's there's there's the Russia there 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 are others that are that are in the in the mix and and uh, trying to get through that forest of tensions is going to be terribly difficult. But in many ways the G20 provides that opportunity, much as. Um, and, 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 and the timing is, as I was saying earlier, the, the fact that G20 will be having its uh, final leaders meeting in early September allows perhaps some of the discussions and those decisions and views to be brought into the other discussions that are going to be taking place later in, in September. This is not a matter of, of, of a month. This is going to be a matter of a very, very long time. But it is uh, it is important uh, and and vital for us to to look at this um, as a as a a process, but as a process where the parts have to keep building upon each other and keeping both the the overall geopolitical tensions in mind and the uh, the, the, the reality of the, the the major economies the major countries but also the needs of the developing uh, world we cannot just ignore that thank you and again it's in the task force statement that this idea and i don't know if this is exactly what you meant but that the that the g20 can be used to leverage um, collaboration and cooperation across multiple different multilateral and plurilateral venues that is critical that india leadership and again no more important time than now for that especially given uh, the geopolitical situation I'm kind of shocked it says 32 seconds is that right <laughs> okay so I, so I think what I'm gonna do is start at this end and just have you all quickly say given the world as it is not as we'd like it to be um, what should the G20's number one most important priority be on this question of multilateralism? Uh, and you get two seconds each. Okay, Del <laughs> deliver. I mean, at the moment, the most important thing is to deliver. For instance, there is the global minimum tax. Okay, I know that the G20 is not an implementing body, but it has to push towards it, its implementation. And the other thing, if I may have- You only got one. The, the last one. <laughs> Financial stability, because here we have many friends from the global south, and we know that 60% of these countries has, are at risk of financial distress. In the short term, for me, this is one of the biggest risks, and the G20, which is its own nature, should 
ta tackle this key issue. Thank you. I think that we need to sit at the table to dialogue and cooperate because um, it's really important not to interrupt uh, uh, the collaborative spirit uh, due to geopolitical tension. So maybe we don't have the outcomes we are expecting, but the, the only uh, issue if we sit on the t at the table, I think uh, it's important. It, it has to be like a routine. And, and, and diplomacy uh, should be forward. And uh, only I, I just want to say that we cannot reinvigorate multilateralism if, if we don't give voice to the global south. Global south needs to acknowledge its power and momentum because we are, we, we are uh, important economies. We have the, the, the status economy. We, are, we have growth uh, population, natural resources, and also technological uh, capital. And I think this should be shifted in a new geopolitical arrangement. So we need to acknowledge it, and we need to, uh, our key attributes, uh, South, Global South needs to um, endorse them and to um, uh, try to increase uh, bargaining power in uh, international negotiations. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, very briefly, how, how can the G20 provide a bridge between the North and the, the South, as, as you put it? Well, uh, first, it's important to recognize the South is not monolithic. The South has been increasingly heterogeneous, and, uh, and so uh, let, let's keep that in mind. The second one, as I already put it, I think it's important to resuscitate the principle of CBDR. That would help negotiations going forward in a large number of issue areas. And finally, in reforming multilateral institutions and giving more voice to the South and to previously excluded or marginalized stakeholders, it's important not just to give them formal representation or a seat at the table, if you will, they need to also have some sort of decisional power. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And actually, a big part of the reason that the current system doesn't work is that the South is largely excluded from it. Thanks. Now, uh, very briefly, I think, the, again, G20 can, is, is a form that can allow us to ease the tensions and deepen the discussions. Uh, and in that sense, to move towards uh, uh, de-risking in a different sense. I mean, to lower the, 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 the risk of conflict that we are all uh, living, experiencing, and also to find those solutions that we're all seeking. And I do hope that the, that the recommendations that are coming from the T20 to the G20 will be able to turn into solutions eventually, not just recommendations. Thank you. Thank you to everybody, um, to all the panelists. Do read the task force statement. It's, it's great. It's very bold. It even takes on dispute settlement mechanism at the WTO. I mean, talk about, you know, talk about a hard nut to crack, not least with um, the U.S. in the state that it's in. Um, I would just close by reminding ourselves, I thought it was a brilliant um, conversation last night. And when Dr. Jay Shanker said that the G20 was about getting India ready for the world and getting the world ready for India. I thought that was a wonderful statement of one of the most central purposes of the G20. So thank you to everybody and um, I think that's it. Thank you.